of faithful there to come every time to this workers training and i pray that they will not come in vain in jesus name and for all the workers who are joining us all over the nation and the continent and beyond we're asking lord that you impact every life even with the knowledge of the truth in jesus name thank you lord because we know you have answered in jesus name we pray Tonight we're talking about something very basic and very necessary and we need to cast our mind back to the time we were saved and what happened after we were saved. What was the condition of our heart when we were saved and what were the doubts and the confusion that we need to resolve after we were born again i'm reading to you from psalm 51 psalm 51 i'm reading from verse 12 restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit you remember when we were born again, we had the joy of salvation. We had that conviction for sin, and we had sorrow for sin. We went to the Lord in prayer, repenting of our sin. We were sorrowful, we were unhappy, sometimes we were even confused. And then as we prayed and prayed through, all of a sudden, there's the assurance that God has answered our prayer, we are forgiven and there was joy in our heart. We well, were not trying to make up the joy. The joy just came naturally. And the Spirit of God bore witness in our heart. We were born again. Isaiah chapter 12. I read from verse 3. Isaiah chapter 12, verse 3. Therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the well of salvation. With joy we drew the assurance like the water, refreshing, very cool, and the freedom in our heart. We knew we were born again because the Spirit of God walked in our hearts, lived in our hearts, and made us to have assurance but then after that joy of salvation temptations will come trials will come after the trial and temptation we began to feel am i really saved am i really born again if i am born again why should temptation come why should trial come and it shook us a little and then not only that, Satan wasn't the situation. You think you are saved. You testify you are saved. Tell me, I put the joy you had at that time. Because now the feeling of excitement and the feeling of joy was dying out and going down. And because we are young converts, we didn't understand, we based everything we experienced on that joy, on that excitement. And so we began to waver and we began to doubt whether we were saved or not. Persecution also came. And we had thought that when we came to Christ, after you are born again, now I belong to God. I'm a child of God. Nobody will touch me. Nobody will do anything to me. I'll be on top of the world. And we discovered persecution came. And the persecutors also spoke and told us, you think, uh, you know, you are doing right. You think you've gone to a good place. And you think you've got something that we don't have and doubts might begin to arise. How did we solve the problem those early weeks and those early months? Even for some people, it continued beyond a year. I'm saved, I'm not saved. I believe I'm saved, but why am I like this? And why do I have this pressure? And why do I have all these doubts? Why am I wavering? 
And so it was very important for us to understand and to clear it up that I am saved. Assurance of salvation. Not only that, when you are called into the service of the Lord, you have assurance. You're almost flying and you're almost on top of the whole world. The Lord has called me. He has called me to service. And with the joy of service, we plunge ourselves into the service of God. But we had some expectations. As I serve the Lord, I'm expecting God will do this for me. God will do that for me. And we think it's automatic. And we think it's immediate. And then after serving the Lord for some time, the devil begins to point some things to us. Look at the need of your life. Look at the prayer you prayed and was it answered. And look at your expectation. Was your expectation met? All of a sudden we began to feel, am I called to the service of the Lord? Am I called to serve the Lord in this capacity? We begin to compare our present situation in the service of the Lord with our past situation before we came to serve the Lord. Again, we began doubting and wondering, am I called into the service of the Lord? If I continue like this and I serve the Lord, what if on the final day he, told, he tells me that, I didn't call you to that, and doubts may begin to come. Not only that in our lives, we are very sure the Lord is calling me to this marital life. You preach, you were so sure. And you could promise anything to the person the Lord is leading you to. I'm so sure, I'm so sure that this is the will of God, perfect will of God. If another person came and uh, said, you are the will of God for me, say, no, please, don't trouble me. I am very sure. And eventually we went on. And then after some time, the wedding was conducted. Now I'm a child of God, I'm also married. And some things began to happen after that marriage. Once you came together, and then some doubts were coming. Am I really sure that I heard from the Lord? Is this the way? Now I'm married, I'm married, but was see the permissive will of God? Why am I going through this? Why is this not happening? Why is that not happening? Doubts come. And then we need assurance. That's why the subject of assurance is very important in the word of God. For salvation, for service, for all circumstances of your life, for all decisions of your life, assurance in the Lord. Coming back to the Bible, how did the first disciples have assurance? That they knew beyond any shadow of doubt that they were children of God and that God had actually saved them through the Lord Jesus Christ. How did they have assurance? Look at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 20. In Luke chapter 10, verse 20. Here the Lord Jesus Christ himself said, Notwithstanding, in this rejoice not, that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice, because your names are written in heaven. There was there were 70 of them. The Lord has sent them out. And when they came back, they reported, they said, This happened, this happened, and that happened. And they were going to anchor their assurance on the things that happened. But you know, that thing may not happen every day. It happened last week. It may not happen this week. And so the Lord Jesus said, don't hang your assurance. Don't hang your faith. Don't hang your joy on that thing. But rejoice because your names are written in heaven names written in heaven assurance christ told them 
and Christ has showed them. And from what they knew about Christ, Christ has said so. I've not been to heaven. I've not seen the book of life. He knows heaven. He knows the book of life. And he has assured me my name is written in heaven. That grants us assurance. Look at the man on the cross. He had been a criminal, a terrible sinner. And now he was about to die, but was still alive suffering on the cross and many thoughts were coming had i known i wouldn't have done that have i known i wouldn't have gone there have i known i wouldn't have committed this last crime that led me to this and eventually he said lord remember me when you come to your kingdom how is the man going to have assurance because everybody has abandoned him because now he is uh, suffering for his sin. And even after the statement of Jesus, he didn't come back from the cross. He wasn't released from that suffering. And he died under that earthly judgment. But Jesus said, I tell you today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That's assurance. Whatever the devil might say, he said, I will be with him in paradise. He didn't just tell everybody. He didn't tell the other criminal, the other sinner, on the other side of the cross. But he told me, that gives assurance, when you hear from the Lord directly. We're looking at Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 9. In Luke chapter 19 verse 9 And Jesus said unto him This day is salvation come to this house For as much as he also is a son of Abraham That gives assurance All the others were saying They were accusing Jesus Is going to be a friend to a sinner Is going to the house of a sinner That's a curse It's a terrible sinner and doubts might be coming in his heart. Although he said, come down quickly. Today I will abide in the house. Now he had all the other people uh, jesting and jeering and, uh, you know, uh, poking uh, fun or whatever about him. And then Jesus said, this day is salvation entered into this house. That finalizes it. Whatever Pharisees might say, whatever Sadducees might say, whatever anybody might say, I have salvation. He said it. He said it openly. And he said it happened at this time, this day. That gives us assurance. John chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 9. John chapter 17, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them whom thou hast given me. For they are thine. He was talking about his own disciples. He said, I pray for them. I pray not for the world. I pray for these that you have given me. You have given them to me. I've accepted them. They are thine. That's assurance. Jesus said, I am his. Whatever the devil might, might insinuate, Jesus said, they are thine. They belong to you. And so that will give assurance in their heart. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 they are not of the world, even as I, I am not of the world. That gives assurance coming from the mouth of Jesus that as he is not of the world and he belongs to the Father, so we are not of the world. He said so. And that even as he himself is, so are we that we are not of the world. That gives assurance. Romans Chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8 from verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. 
as many as are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. Since I became born again, am I not conscious that the Spirit of God is saying, go this way, go that way? You will hear a voice behind you that will say, this is the way, what he in it. And when I make that decision, I'm going this direction, there is joy in my heart. There's assurance in my heart. I am being led by the Spirit of God. That's assurance. Verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. What fear of superstition it took away from our heart, we are born again. The fear of tradition it took away from us when we were born again, and the fear of eventually perishing. We just knew in our heart, I will not perish. I now belong to the Lord. He died for me on the cross of Calvary. I have that assurance, and there is no fear of eternity or the fear of hell. Then it says, But she have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. That's assurance. That's assurance. The Spirit talking to us, Jesus talking to us, the Scriptures talking to us that we are saved, that we belong to God, we're children of God, that gives us assurance. And this same thing, we need to help the new converts as the new converts come to know the Lord. We need to help them know that they can have assurance. Tonight, we're looking at the subject, the indisputable assurance of saved souls. The indisputable assurance of saved souls. Assurance that you cannot contradict. Assurance that you cannot erase. Assurance you cannot take away from the heart of a saved soul. The indisputable assurance of saved souls. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the firm assurance of our salvation. The firm assurance of our salvation. Point number two. The fixed assurance in the scripture. The fixed assurance in the scripture. Number three, our full assurance of his sufficiency. Saved by grace and kept by grace. Saved through the atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Kept by that same atonement on the cross of Calvary. Converted, cleansed, preserved by the same blood that is shed on the cross of Calvary. We find that Christ is sufficient for us. And because of that sufficiency, we have assurance. Number one, the firm assurance of our salvation. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, it says in this verse 21, And thou shalt call, and she shall call, she shall bring forth his son. And thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save his people from their sins. Picture it this way. Somebody fell into the well. He struggled to come out by himself. He couldn't come out. And somebody stretched forth a hand, a helping hand, and pulled him out. He is out of that well. Does he have assurance? Of course, of course, he was inside. It was dark. It was almost drowned. And then a hand came and pulled him out. 
and he knows it's not in the well, the knowledge that he was inside sin, the well of sin, the knowledge that he saved out of that well of sin, and his life has changed. And he has tried many times to turn over a new leaf by resolution. It didn't happen. And now it has happened. The things I used to do, I do them no more. He shall save his people from their sins. That gives him assurance because now there is a change. Acts chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 30. Acts chapter 5. Reading from verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you slew and hanged on a tree. Him has God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins, to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Look up here. This person hated himself before for what he was doing. But he couldn't change. And the good I want to do, that I cannot do. The evil I didn't want to do, that's what I was doing. But now he heard about Christ. And he came to Christ. And he prayed to start with, he began to confess a sin in a way that he knew this is not me. I couldn't have confessed my sin like this and the thing was just pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. I will never do that again. Oh Lord, save me, change my life, change my heart. He repented, not by himself, but the repentance that Christ gave him. And then forgiveness, forgive me, Lord, and peace came to the heart. And now he knew, my sins are forgiven. That feeling of forgiveness that followed after that clear repentance that he knew. I wasn't just repenting, you know, superficially. Christ gave me this repentance. My sins are forgiven. That gives him assurance. We're looking at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 6. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Now that Saul of Tarsus, he had never, never thought of submitting to Christ. He knew himself he was an enemy of Christ. He knew of himself he wasn't going to follow the religion of these Nazarene, Nazarites. And then he knew, call yourself an apostle, call yourself a disciple, I am after you. He was running after them. All of a sudden, there was an event, something happened. He fell to the ground, all of a sudden, he found himself saying what he had never said. He couldn't have submitted to anybody and he couldn't see him. But he said, Lord, what will thou have me do? That softening of the heart, that change of the heart, that turning around to be asking the Lord, what should you have me do? And the willingness to have a change of course, a change of direction, and a change of profession. That's the assurance. I couldn't have thought of that by myself. That is what the Lord has done in me. That gives assurance. Look at verse 9. And it was three days without sight, neither did eat nor drink. Even the things that were normal, he abandoned them. That was not of himself. He was now praying like he never prayed. And he's talking to this Lord that spoke to him on the way to Damascus. He didn't care what other people were saying. That's assurance. That's a real child of God. A change had taken place. An assurance had come to him. Look at verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, 
those two words, assurance. And Ananias would not have called him brother Saul. The Lord had spoken to Ananias. And the Lord has spoken to another person concerning him. He is now my disciple. And I will show him what great things he will suffer for my sake. And when other people, when they see the change, and the Lord is witnessing in their heart, that's a changed man, that's a changed woman, what he was before he is no more, that gives us assurance. I'm looking at Second Timothy chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19. It says, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. The foundation of God standeth sure. Having the seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. The Lord knoweth them that are his. How do I know? That he knows me, that I belong to him. Look at the latter part of that verse. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. When the willingness is in me, and the willingness was not there before, to depart from iniquity. When the grace has come to me to depart from iniquity. And when the joy, I have joy in departing from iniquity. And I look at myself, I said, you know, I can't enjoy those things I was doing before. I can't go to those places I was going before. And it is not because uh, one pastor preacher is following after me and saying, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. No, not at all. Just personally, something has happened that I am now willing and ready and gracious to depart from iniquity. The Lord knows me that I'm one of his. That's assurance. We're looking at Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 5. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 5. Here is verse 5. Five, it says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. You discover that you loved to go to nightclubs, you loved gambling, you loved all the things of the world that give pleasure to the flesh. All of a sudden, you are no more interested. All of a sudden, something happened that nightclub, gambling, whatever, all those thoughts in your mind, they're gone. You're no more of the flesh. That gives you assurance. And then it says, but they that are after the Spirit, things of the Spirit. You love to read the Bible now. You are thinking of heaven now. Some of the hymns that you learned in the church, denominational church before, they were coming afresh to your mind. And then you sing them now with meaning. All of a sudden, those songs are meaningful to you now. You mind the things of the Spirit. I was glad when they said unto me, Let us go to the house of the Lord. You're so glad you're going to church, and then you get to the church. It's not like before you are, you are absent minded. Now you enjoy the service, and all that the preacher is saying, you are taking note. Nobody told you, you must write down anything spontaneously. You just started writing the things now, and you started reading your Bible, and then as you get back home, you're going over the Bible again that gives you assurance because I wasn't like this before this wasn't what I wanted to do before there's a new thing and this new thing gives you assurance look at verse 6 for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God the carnal mind is enmity against God. Before, when you hear God, you think of judgment. You think of somebody who has discovered what evil things have done and is going to smash your head. Now you hear God and say, that's my father. It brings pleasure. It brings joy into your heart. And when you call him God and call him father, that brings joy to your heart. 
workers assurance something has happened on the inside you are no more at enmity with him for it is not subject to the law of god neither indeed can be those who are sinners those who don't have assurance they don't have joy in listening to god but now lord what will you have me to do look at verse 8 so then they that are in the flesh cannot please god they're not even willing to please god they reject pleasing god and they reject anything that will make them want to please god but ye are not in the flesh but in the spirit if so be that the spirit of god dwell in you you might not know the spirit of god dwelling in you but you know you are thinking of something and there's a voice coming from within it's a soothing voice it's an assuring voice and he's saying my son my child somebody is calling me his child and somebody is referring to me his son his daughter that gives you assurance things are different now and in all these various ways from all these various scriptures you know that you are not like you used to be there's assurance in your heart i am a child of god we're looking at second timothy chapter 1 verse 12 second timothy chapter 1 i'm reading from verse 12 for the which cause i also suffer these things nevertheless i am not ashamed i am not ashamed you know you, when you were going to a gospel church after you left that other denomination denomination and then but you were not born again you wrap your bible and then you're afraid somebody might see you going there and then you look here and there there was something inside your heart wanting to hear the truth but there was another thing pulling you back but now that has happened salvation conversion christ has come to your heart and you are not living by the grace that came to your heart now you are not ashamed you're a child of god you're born again and you're willing to tell somebody somebody must know about this it's a new life that came to me and now i am not ashamed then it says for i know whom i have believed i know gamaliel may not understand this but i know sanhedrin may not understand this but i know the pharisees may not understand this but i know whom i have believed and i am persuaded that he is able to keep that which i have committed unto him against that day that's assurance that's assurance i am persuaded that is assurance the firm assurance of our salvation point number two the fixed assurance in the scriptures the fixed assurance in the scriptures look at isaiah chapter 34 isaiah chapter 34 verse 16 seek ye out of the book of the lord and read seek ye out of the book of the lord and read no one of thee shall fail none shall want her mate for my mouth it has commanded and his spirit it has gathered them we have assurance also through the scripture we read in the word of god whosoever the father has given me will come unto me and he that cometh to me i will in no wise cast out i read that again i read that again there's something in my heart drawing me to go to christ there's a dissatisfaction in religion there's a dissatisfaction in all that i've been trying to do from this denomination that denomination, that denomination but now there is something pulling me and drawing me to come to christ whosoever the father has given me will come to me and then not just as something is pulling me i now came i said father i come and i come to jesus i want him to be my savior 
I want him to be my all in all. I want him to direct my life. And whosoever cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. That scripture gives me assurance. Seek ye out of the book of the Lord and read. No one of these shall fail. None shall want her neighbor for my mouth it has it has commanded and his spirit it has gathered them that gives me assurance numbers in numbers chapter 23 reading from verse 19 numbers chapter 23 and we're reading from verse 19 god is not a man that is your lie Neither the son of man that he shall repent, as he said, and shall he not do it? Or as he spoke in, and shall he not make it good? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's his word. That's what he declared. And here am I. I didn't even know how to call on the name of the Lord before, but I heard the word. That the Savior wants me. And then I began to call in a way I never called. In a way I never prayed. I used to pray from our denominational prayer book. And then you will open and you will read it out. I used to pray from the Psalms. I have to open the Psalms and read Psalm 51 and read Psalm 23. That was what I thought was prayer. But now spontaneously. I just began to call on the name of the Lord. And I said, you are my savior. I come out of my sin. I was praying freely from my heart. And then the soothing assurance came from heaven. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not a man that he should lie. Neither the son of man that he should repent. As he said, and shall he not do it? As he spoke in, and shall he not make it good? I am saved. I am saved. Let somebody say it aloud. I am saved. Psalm 89. I'm reading from verse 34. Psalm 89. We're reading from verse 34. In verse 34. My covenant will I not break, nor alter the sin that is gone out of my lips. My covenant. He had covenant with Abraham. He had covenant with David. But now he has covenant with Christ. He has covenant with Christ. That this Christ is the Lamb of God that is to save the whole world and is to forgive the sins of the whole world. And the covenant the Father has with the Son. Go to the world, sacrifice and be their substitute, and whosoever will put confidence in that sacrifice and substitution that you are going to make, I will pardon that person. All their iniquity, I will lay on you. And once you bear their iniquity, they will not bear that iniquity anymore. He fulfilled this covenant with Abraham. He fulfilled this covenant with David. He is fulfilling his covenant with Christ. My covenant... Will I not break, nor alter the sin that has gone out of my lips? That gives me assurance. Christ died for me. He shed his blood. All my sins are put together, bundled together, and laid on him. What he carried, I will not carry anymore. And as I look at that word of God, that the Father's covenant with his only begotten Son, he will not break. I have assurance I'm on my way to heaven. You're on your way to heaven. And the Lord will not cast you off in Jesus' name. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 30. And I'm reading from verse 5. Proverbs 
chapter 30, verse 5. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. That put their trust in him. Those were the days of searching for security and protection. That's what sent some of us to the house of a herbalist. That's what sent, sent some of us uh, to the shrine of occultism. But now, one day, we woke up and say, this security is insecurity. And this protection is uh, something vulnerable that will lead us into perdition. And we took our confidence and we took our security away from the shrine, away from the idol, and we put it on Christ. And we say, Christ, you are my savior from now on. You are my security from now on. And it says, his word is pure. He, the Savior, He, the Redeemer, is a shield unto them that put their trust in Him voluntarily. You put your trust in the Lord. And it says, It's going to be your shield. And as the arrows of doubt, arrows of confusion, and arrows of wavering may be coming, the shield that's the Lord Jesus Christ will kind of sway them off because now you have put your trust in the Lord. I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 14. The fixed assurance in the scripture. The scripture gives us assurance. What he has said will he lie upon. What he has said we depend on and we stand solidly on that assuring word he has given us some fourth Isaiah 40 I'm reading from verse 8 the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of our God shall stand forever the word of our God shall stand forever you see at that time when I gave my life to the Lord then the joy of salvation came but the joy of salvation came on the basis of the word of God that I believe whosoever shall come on the name of the Lord shall be saved and if you turn away from your sin he that covereth his sin shall not prosper but he that confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy I found myself confessing my sin I found myself telling the Lord I will no more go in the way of sinning and then mercy came joy came and the love of God came forgiveness has come and that word that made that forgiveness and that salvation to come abides and stands forever your feelings may waver your feelings may change but the word of god will not change and your a sense of the excitement and the joy may waver and change but the solidity of the world the foundation of the world will never change it says but the word of our god shall stand how long tell me tell me look at first peter first peter chapter one first peter chapter one this is the word. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, not by feeling. We're not born again by our feeling. We're not born again by circumstances. We're not born again by our shouting, our crying, whatever we did. We're born again by the incorruptible seed, by the word of God, which lives and abides for how long? Tell me, tell me. Forever. For all flesh is as grass. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass, the grass withers. 
and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. That's the word you believe, or you are saved. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's no doubt about it. It, it only depends on your coming. Come. Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. And it says, that's the word, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. This word that abideth forever. The benefit of that word that abides forever, this word abideth forever. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 55, Isaiah chapter 55, the fixed assurance in the scripture. Isaiah chapter 55, I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah 55, verse 11, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. I sent it for your salvation. I sent it for your conversion. I sent it out. You embrace it. You believe it. You accept it. It shall prosper in the sin for which I have sent it. That gives us assurance of salvation. His word came to me. I embrace that word. I accepted that word. I believe that word personalized, personally for me. And I know it is done. I am saved. That gives assurance your feelings might waver when you become if you're sick for example you know a doubt might be coming i'm sick like this and this is happening couldn't god have prevented this why did this happen to me after all am i really sure i'm a child of god sickness circumstances whatever may make you waver but then you come to the word and you have the fixed assurance in the scripture he sent his word to me and his word brought salvation to me and i believe that word embrace that word and claimed it for myself i know i am saved we're coming to matthew chapter 24 in matthew chapter 24 i read from verse 35 matthew chapter 24 i'm reading from verse 35 it says heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away the sky may fold up the earth may go out of existence a particular volcano might come and displace a whole town a whole village even after that has happened the words of Christ, the words of my Savior, the assurance that he gave. Rejoice because your names are written in heaven. That word cannot fail and that word cannot fall to the ground. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That word cannot fail. That word cannot fall to the ground. Whoso confesseth and forsaketh the sins shall have mercy. That word cannot fail. That word will not fail. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That word cannot fail. Heaven and earth shall pass away but my word shall not pass away the word of God that gives us assurance will not pass away in your life Titus chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 2 Titus chapter 1 I'm reading from verse 2 in hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began in hope of eternal life which god who cannot lie 
God cannot lie. God cannot lie. And he promised it before the world began. That's before you were even born into this world. And before religion, denominations of different types came up in this world, God had promised us eternal life. And he has said, whosoever, whosoever, whosoever will believe on his only begotten son will have eternal life. And he cannot lie. And that word has been there before you were born. And now that you are in the world, you came on the strength of that word. Whosoever will say, that's me, I'm going to Christ. That's me, I'm going to believe in Christ. And you believe in Christ. And now you are saved. That gives us assurance. Thank God I have assurance. I say, thank God I have assurance. I'm a child of God. Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. I read from verse 25. Acts chapter 27, verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. I believe God. It shall be. It cannot be otherwise. His word cannot fail. Satan cannot change his word. Circumstances cannot change his word. Persecutors cannot change his word. Jewish religion cannot change his, wo his word. The, the religions of the world cannot change his word. Be of good cheer, for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. That gives us assurance the fixed assurance in the scripture as you look at the scriptures the promise salvation and then you went through those scriptures and you believed according to the scriptures and you held on fast according to the scriptures and you were stable and steadfast and solid according to the scriptures the scriptures cannot be broken the scriptures will not be broken Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Number one, the firm assurance of our salvation. Number two, the fixed assurance in the scripture. Number three, our full assurance of his sufficiency. Our full assurance of his sufficiency. I want you to uh, picture a kind of wide ocean. And there's a narrow bridge that passes across that wide ocean. And there is somebody, an expert, who has been carrying people from this shore to that shore. That bridge cannot take a vehicle. That bridge cannot take a train. But it can take a man carrying another person and they're crossing over and there's a great gulf of water underneath and you've seen him he carried somebody they went over he carried another they went over and you've been watching he carried another he went over and now it's your turn and he says do you believe I can carry you across and get you to the other side. You say, yes, of course I believe. Okay, come on here. Let me carry you. Uh-uh, I'm not ready yet. You don't believe. You don't believe. You're looking at the ocean. You're looking at the bridge. You're looking at the circumstances. And you don't find him sufficient to carry you. The Lord Jesus Christ has saved other people. And he carried them over. And now they're on the other shore. He's carried all those apostles, all those disciples, all those men and women, brothers and sisters in the New Testament. And he's carried all those people after the right of the Bible. He's carried all the believers that have believed on him until this time. And he's landing them on the other shore. Landing them on the other shore. And then he says, it comes to your turn. Can he carry you? Will he carry you through? Do you have assurance? 
that even though Satan may not like this, demons may not like this, and even though there may be people that, you know, you deserve to go to hell. You are so wicked. See what you did to me. See what you did to me. You must go to hell. But Jesus said, don't listen to them. Keep on looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith, and let him carry you. He'll carry you to the other side. Full assurance, our full assurance of his sufficiency. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10, I'm reading from verse 22. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Let us draw near. It's Christ, it's carrying other people. It's lifted other people, it's dropped other people right at the gate of heaven and it's taking them to heaven. He took the thief from the cross and got him to heaven that day. Let us now draw near with a full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with poor water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful that promised he'll carry you through hebrews chapter 6 reading from verse 11 full assurance full assurance hebrews chapter 6 verse 11 and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. There's no, there's no reason to doubt Christ. He's done it before, he'll do it again. And he has assured us that he will carry us through and he is sufficient for us. His grace is sufficient, you will not be disappointed. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. And he said unto me, he said unto me, he said unto me. Paul the Apostle was going through some turbulent time. And Satan was buffeting and buffeting. He went to God because it's like, Will this buffeting allow me to finish well and to get through? And the Lord said unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee. And today, his grace is sufficient for you. In that circumstance, his grace is sufficient for you. In that situation, his grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 9 and verse 10. Colossians chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of God the Godhead bodily in Christ our Savior in Christ our sustainer in Christ our sanctifier in Christ in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and we are complete in him and we are complete in him there is nothing we need on this journey from here to heaven there's nothing we need in this journey of our service, of our salvation, of our service, of all our lives. There's nothing we need that we don't find in Christ because we are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. He is sufficient. I said he is sufficient. In Second Corinthians chapter 3 second corinthians chapter 3 from verse 5 not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think any sin of ourselves but tell me if you have not gone back home i said tell me tell me 
If you are sure of this, tell me out aloud. Our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is of God. You'll find all grace sufficient to your life in Jesus' name. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward who? Toward you. That ye always having, always having, always having all sufficiency in all things may abound unto every good work. Any amen? amen? The Lord confirm it in every life in Jesus' name. A Savior is sufficient. Whatever we need, whatever situation, whatever circumstances, our Savior is sufficient. Number one, He is sufficient as Savior. He is sufficient as Savior. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him, seeing he ever lived to make intercession for them. A savior is sufficient. He has saved you, he'll keep you saved. As a helper, he's sufficient. Any need in our lives, any help we need, it will help you. I said it will help you. As our helper, he is sufficient. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 6. Hebrews 13, verse 6. So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man shall do unto me. A savior you'll find him sufficient as helper you'll find him sufficient as our keeper he will keep you psalm 121 i'm reading from verse 5 psalm 121 we're reading from verse 5 in psalm 121 verse 5 the lord is thy keeper is stronger than Satan, the Lord is thy keeper. Is stronger than every persecutor, the Lord is thy keeper. Is stronger than the circumstances and the situation in our country and any country, the Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. It shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth even forevermore. How long can he keep you? I said how long can he keep you? Whatever you are going through, you will go through victoriously, triumphantly. After that, he'll keep on keeping you and keeping you and keeping you until you appear on the right side of River Jordan. We're coming to Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 18. He is our preserver and he's sufficient, sufficient as our preserver. Second Timothy chapter 4. Reading from verse 18, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work. Today, tomorrow, next week, next month, for the rest of your life, the Lord shall deliver you from every evil work. 
and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever Amen. Amen. he is our preserver and you remember he is our healer and no sickness is so great and so terrible that you'll we'll say well christ the healer is not sufficient for this he's sufficient in all things sufficient as savior sufficient as helper sufficient as keeper sufficient as preserver sufficient as your healer in exodus chapter 15 verse 26 exodus chapter 15 verse 26 and said if thou shalt will dig it hearken to the voice of the lord thy god and will do that which is right in his sight and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes i will put none of these diseases upon thee which are put upon the egyptians remember this word of god stands forever for i am the lord that healeth thee i am the lord tell me say it aloud say that again nothing they throw to you from the world will ever strike you he is the lord that healeth you he's our healer he's our deliverer i'm looking at second corinthians chapter one verse 10 second corinthians chapter one verse 10 who delivered us that's the past from so great a death and does deliver that's in the present at the present time and in whom we trust that he will yet in the future deliver us delivered in the past the god of yesterday is the god of today and the god of today is the god of tomorrow he is sufficient for us as our deliverer we have assurance and it's a full assurance assurance of salvation assurance of his keeping assurance of his preservation and assurance of his deliverance he delivered us past tense he does deliver present tense in whom we trust he will yet deliver us he is sufficient as our sanctifier sufficient as our sanctifier first thessalonians chapter 5 Reading from verse 23, First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Somebody say amen. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, everybody read together, one, two, three, go. Ah, you read that the second time. Verse 24, one, two, go. Now read it with assurance, in fullness of assurance. Verse 24. Faithful is seed that calleth you. He will do it. He is a provider. He is sufficient as a provider. Whatever need of your life, you will not starve. You will not go hungry. You will not be a beggar. Heaven will rain manna in your life, in your family, in Jesus' name. He is sufficient as a provider. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 but my god shall supply my god shall supply my god shall supply all you need according to his riches in glory by christ jesus do you have assurance of that 
you will not be disappointed. He is our baptizer, our baptizer, and is sufficient to baptize us and endue us with power. Acts chapter 1, verse 5 and verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. For John truly really baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Your endowment of power is not far away. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. The amen is dying out. Now Isaiah chapter 48, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17, he is our teacher. Anywhere you are, he will teach you. Whatever you need to succeed in ministry, he will teach you. Whatever you need to make profit in everything he has called you to, the Lord will be your teacher. Isaiah chapter 48 verse 17 Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel I am the Lord thy God Which teaches thee to profit Teaches thee to profit Is being a teacher for you is not in vain You will profit which leadest thee in the way that thou shouldest go. O oh, that thou art hearkened to my commandments, then at thy peace being as a river, and thy righteousness as the waters of the sea. He will be your teacher. He is our rock. He is our rock. Water came out of the rock for the children of Israel. Water, freshness, will come out of this rock for you, for me, for us together in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 10, reading from verse 4. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4. And did all drink the same spiritual drink. For the, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ that rock was Christ look at the promise of God which will not fail in your life Psalm 81 Psalm 81 reading here from verse 13 Psalm 81 Reading from verse 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me. And Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdued their enemies. They will subdue your enemies. And turned my hand against their adversaries. The haters of the Lord should have submitted themselves unto him. But... Their time shall have endured forever. Verse 16, He should have fed them also with the finest of wheat and waste. Tell me, honey, from where? Out of the rock should I have satisfied them. Satisfaction in your life. With honey out of the rock. Speak to the rock. And that honey will flow out into your life, into your service, into your ministry, in Jesus' name. Our Savior is sufficient as a Savior. Is sufficient as a helper. Is sufficient as a keeper. Is sufficient as a preserver. Is sufficient as our healer. Is sufficient as our deliverer, is sufficient as our sanctifier, he is sufficient as our provider, 
He is sufficient as a baptizer. He is sufficient as a teacher. He is sufficient as our rock. He is sufficient as the giver. As the giver. He will give all things you need for this day, for the days to come, for the rest of our lives. He's our giver. Always go back to him. He will give you richly good things to enjoy. We're looking at uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 32. Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also give us, tell me, Freely give us, tell me. Freely give us, tell your neighbor all things. He is our giver. He'll give you all things that are needed. Your spiritual life, your family life, your physical life, your professional life, you will not lack in Jesus' name. We have a full assurance of a sufficiency Assurance of a salvation, assurance in the scriptures, assurance of his sufficiency. With that assurance, let's go to the Lord in prayer and say, Lord, I am sure more than ever that you are my sufficiency. I am sure more than ever. I'm sure of my salvation. I'm sure of my conversion. I'm sure of my relationship with you. I'm sure of your grace. I'm sure of the scriptures. I'm sure of your promises. I'm sure of your sufficiency. Call upon the Lord. Whatever the need may be, you'll find him completely and totally sufficient today we have indisputable assurance that you will carry us through 